Hello and welcome to the third video in this series. In the first video, we used burst compiled jobs to cull millions of objects on huge terrain in a performant way. There should be a link to that video in the top right if you missed it. In the second video, we saw how to prepare render data in burst compiled jobs so that we can easily render in the order of 100,000 variable visible objects per frame. These methods include indirect rendering and per instance properties sent to the GPU. Again, there should be a link to that video in the top right if you missed it. Today, we conclude the rendering mini-series by digging into the shader code to see what we need to do to have our shaders consume all of this data and render everything correctly. We will focus on the parts of the shaders that use the indirect data and apply the per-instance specifications, rather than the entirety of the shaders, since I'm sure you have other plans for today as well. In the last video, we saw how we use graphics.rendermesh indirect to send the draw calls to the GPU after the data has been prepared in burst compiled jobs. Included in this data are three buffers that are important to our shaders that accompany this call. The first two buffers provide the shaders with the index and transformation matrix of each object to be rendered. We fill the buffers with the matrices in view as previously determined and the indices and then send them to the material of the render parameter. In order for the shader of the material to have access to this data, we need to perform some indirect rendering setup in the shader. I have created a separate script for this purpose, which also includes the standard Unity scripts. Here we define a float 4x4 struct for the transformation matrices, as well as an integer struct for the indices. We also define a structured buffer for each of these, which contains the actual data. When using graphics.rendermesh indirect, the built-in transformation matrices Unity Object to World and Unity World to Object are not available. We need to handle this manually. The in-view transformation matrices sent through to the buffer are in world space, via the position, rotation and scale values built into the matrix that tell the shader where the object is in the world, which direction it is facing and how large it is. This is the Object to World matrix and it transforms a vertex in the mesh's object space into the world space. We need to determine the inverse of this matrix to get the world to object matrix. There's actually room for optimization here if your objects comply with certain restrictions. For example, if you know that their scale is always the same or their rotation is always the same, you don't have to include the scale and or rotation in the data sent through to the GPU, reducing the strain on the pipeline between CPU and GPU. Your shader will then use constant scale and rotation values to set up the matrices. But in our case, we cater for completely variable position, rotation and scale. This provides us with a world to object matrix that can be used to obtain the object space position of any world space vertex. That takes care of the transformation matrices. Our third and final buffer contains the instance properties. In this example, I allocate two integers for each instance. But this struct can include whatever you need it to include, although you don't want to limit its size for performance reasons. Recall from the previous video that when we create a random human, we pick a random face, hat, clothes, shoes, etc. Each of these choices needs to be saved so that the shader knows which version of each of the elements has been selected for each instance. The options are packed into the bits of an integer, while highlight detail is packed into the bits of a second integer. There are also some bits left for future use. As we've seen during the last video, this buffer is also sent to the material of the render parameters. Now we have everything we need to render the instances. Here you can see how I prevent the triangles for the non-selected parts of the combined mesh from being displayed by effectively culling those vertices. I cull the vertices rather than clipping the fragments since culling vertices automatically clip all the fragments in that triangle which is less work than clipping all the fragments. Secondly, you can see how I tint the albedo color sourced from the texture by various color options, including a tint strength loop based on the sign of time. We can eventually devise many alternative treatments here, depending on the feedback you need to send to the player. And that's it for this video. We've covered rendering in a three-part mini-series now, and I need to decide what main theme the next few videos should cover. So please let me know in the comments what you would like more detail about. Please subscribe to this channel, wishlist and follow Minor Deity on Steam, or join the Discord server to stay up to date. All the links are down below. As always, feel free to ask specific questions you may have.
Thanks for your time and support.